Good morning. Welcome to our Savior Lutheran Church. If you haven't had a chance to look at the bulletin yet as we go through the service, you'll notice that it's really a celebration. And yes, I know every Sunday is a celebration, but this is uh, a special celebration in that we are moving from a church in exile because of COVID-19, scattered all over the North Shore, and now a church that's beginning to regather, and for that we give great thanks to the Lord. I invite you to stand wherever you are and join in the responsive call to worship based on a portion of Psalm 118. Thank God because he's good. Because his love never quits. Tell the world, Israel, his love never quits. And you, clan of Aaron, tell the world, his love never quits. And you who fear God, join in. His, His love, love never quits. Blessed are you who enter in God's name. From God's house we bless you. God is God. He has bathed us in light. Festoon the shrine with garlands. Hang colored banners above the altar. You are my God, and I thank you. O oh God, I lift high your praise. Thank God, he's so good. His love never quits. Powerful hymn, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing boldly.
mindful of our identity in Christ given to us in baptism, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of the word, by the authority of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament, Psalm 122. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your prosperity. The second reading from the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Another text that 
highlights the importance of Christian community as we live out the truth of the gospel. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our common Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of community that you have united us as your people, and not only those who are gathered here, but those who are gathered in every place under the heavens. As we ponder your word, as we read it, may it read us. And where we need encouragement, may we receive encouragement. Where we need to be convicted, we pray that that conviction would come and we would not experience it as a slap on the face, but as a kiss from you as you seek to work in our lives in such a way that we are more fully inhabited by your grace and your glory in the gospel. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wednesday night, Paige and I met some friends in Newburyport for some al fresco dining. Though the wait was long, the food was good, the company was much better. Like most of you, Paige and I have eaten in countless restaurants over the years. And yet, what was once so commonplace was now so uncommon. Truthfully, it felt a little strange sitting at a table and looking at a menu, ordering food and having it delivered table side. Even though it was an unseasonably cool evening, almost cold, I was particularly glad to be there. Glad. I suspect that's how many of us feel as we transition back to worshiping together. In the past, corporate worship, well, was so commonplace. Sunday after Sunday, here we go again. Some Saturday nights or Sunday mornings, we undoubtedly thought to ourselves, do we have to? I'm really tired and would love to get some extra sleep. 
Or there are so many other things that I would like to do. Church can wait. Surely Jesus understands. I can always go back next Sunday. But then we couldn't. And it wasn't just that we couldn't. It was when we couldn't. During Lent and Holy Week. And even on Easter, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I struggled in choosing a, a text that was well suited for us as we again gather for corporate worship. Now, the more I thought about it, the more I returned to our Old Testament text from Psalm 122. And the way in which I remembered it, uh, remember it from memorizing it long ago, the, the psalmist really sums up what is our sentiment. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Well, before we take a deep dive into our text, it's probably valuable for us to, to do a little bit of the, the background work. Uh, you may recall that the Israelites were required to present themselves before the Lord three times a year. In the spring, in the summer, and then again in the fall. They were to travel to Jerusalem if they weren't already living there uh, to celebrate Passover, a commemoration of their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Then in the summer, they were to celebrate Shavuot, something like that. My Hebrew isn't very good anymore, uh, which is the, the festival of weeks, which is really like an early Thanksgiving uh, for a harvest. And then in the fall, they would have the festival of Sukkot, which is the festival of booths. They would uh, remember how they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And during those four decades in the wilderness, the Lord always protected them and always provided for them. Since a large number of Jewish people did not live in Jerusalem, they had to make the pilgrimage there three times a year. And you can imagine that when it was time to journey yet again, some of them were like us and they said, do we have to? My bunion is killing me. Can I skip this one? I've got a ton of homework. There are crops to tend to and cattle to take care of, but most were eager to go. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Again, as many of you know, when they were making their journey from the foreign land to Jerusalem, they would recite that small section of psalms within the book of psalms known as the Psalms of Ascent. And they're so named because one always ascends to Jerusalem, goes up to Jerusalem. And the most well-known among those 15 Psalms of Ascent is Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 122, our text for this morning is the third in this small collection of psalms. And there's actually this interesting transition because you begin it with uh, Psalm 120, which has been described as uh, expressing their uh, duress because they're living in a foreign land far from Jerusalem. Then there's a transition to Psalm 121 where they talk about the hazards and the help, the hazards that they uh, encounter along the way to Jerusalem and the help that the Lord provides them step by step. So think distance, Psalm 120, trial, Psalm 121, and then with Psalm 122, there is joy. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's as if all of the, the distress that they had experienced and all of the trials that they encountered along the way are immediately eclipsed 
by the mere thought of going to Jerusalem, how much more so standing within the gates of that holy city. In meditating on this Psalm 3, sources of joy came to me as I was reading through that psalm. And for your sake and my sake, and some of you say you always choose C's or P's. It is P's today. Uh, it, it's the place and the people and the promises. It's the place and the people and the promises. That's where the ultimate joy comes from. So we'll begin with, with, uh, with uh, um, <laughs> my brain isn't working. Thank you, with, with the place. So wherever the Israelites were, uh, they continued to worship the Lord. But there was something about worshiping the Lord in Jerusalem. As we all know, the Lord is omnipresent. He's present everywhere, but he is present in some places in a different way. May, might we even say that he's more present in some places and that's why it was so important for the Israelites to come to Jerusalem because there the Lord was present among his people in a special way. He had promised to dwell in the temple in their very midst that he might be their God and that they might be his people. And I believe that's true for us too, although in a bit different way. We too can worship the Lord in our living rooms, and many of us have done that the past three months. We can worship the Lord in the afternoon, just waking up from our hibernation, and we can get out our iPad, and without brushing our hair or brushing our teeth, we, we can worship the Lord, and we can worship the Lord while we walk in the woods. We can worship the Lord while we play a round of golf. Well, I'm not actually convinced about that last one, but we can worship the Lord in all kinds of places. But there is something special about worshiping the Lord here and in so many other churches. There's something about worshiping the Lord in a place that has been set apart for him, a place that has been dedicated to the worship of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I was thinking, you know, the familiarity of coming into this place or other places week after week, it kind of dulls our senses. But I think COVID-19 has heightened and increased our senses. Gathering in this place or even in the parking lot, we are just glad to be here. Amen? Amen. The people, or the place rather, and now for the people. Uh, Psalm 122 has a community written all over it. Uh, to be sure, there is diversity. It speaks about tribes, and with the, within the tribes there was, uh, there was uh, distinctions and uniqueness and differences. There was diversity but also divine unity. The psalmist says that these tribes that are diverse, they are also united. The psalmist says that they are tribes of the Lord, which points to the fact that they have a, a common covenant with this God of grace, with Yahweh, with the Lord. That none of them were better than or superior than the others. That all of them had the same need and all of them were sharers in that same covenant of grace as are we. They had a common covenant and they had a common purpose. To praise the name of Yahweh, to praise the name of the Lord. 
as I've already stated, you and I can worship God anywhere. But there's something about places and this place for us in particular where we would come to worship the Lord. And likewise, we we can worship the Lord alone. After all, all of life is to be an act of worship. But there is something powerful, there is something necessary about corporate worship. The writer to the Hebrews, as we heard moments ago, exhorts us not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, especially in light of the age. That we are to uh, gather all the more as we see the day approaching. And what day is that? It is the day in which we look beyond the isolation and the trials to that day of justice and peace. Justice is what's causing people to march in the streets. They are demanding justice in the wake of George Floyd's death and the deaths of many other people of color. They want those responsible for it to be held accountable. They also want to dismantle a system that is deemed racist at its core. And create a new system that is just and takes into consideration all people. And please understand that that is a a noble, those are noble endeavors. But I have two questions, and the first question is, is the former really justice? And humanly speaking, is the latter actually possible? Uh, Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. People should be held accountable for their actions, whether or not they wear a uniform. However, if the officers involved in George Floyd's death are convicted and sent to prison, is that justice? It would be justice according to the law of the land, but that is not justice in the truest and fullest biblical sense. And here's why. George Floyd is not made whole by them going to prison. He is not made alive. And while his family might have some closure in their conviction, their grief does not immediately turn to rejoicing. Likewise, unjust laws should be changed, period. But even the most just laws seek to restrain those who would otherwise act unjustly and punish those who actually do. They seek to restrain and punish, but they do not address the human heart. And the heart, as you know, is the problem. And not just for a few bad people, but for all people, including us. And this problem cannot be remedied by us. It cannot be remedied by any number of laws or human actions. It demands, it requires divine intervention. 
It requires that, that we experience for ourselves justice. It requires that we ourselves be made whole, and that only takes place in Jesus, the one who is the true temple. And that justice that is true justice has been fully satisfied in Jesus for us. And more than that, Jesus is in the process of renewing us, restoring us, making us whole. As Paul says, that he who began a good work in you, God has begun a good work in us. And the promise that he makes to us is that he's going to complete that work on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is justice. That is the gospel. That is the gospel for us and at work in us and at work through us. So it is that promise, that gospel narrative, a gospel narrative that was known even in the Old Testament. That, that's, that's our hubris sometimes. We think the Old Testament is all law and the, and the New Testament is all gospel. They had just as much gospel. It pointed to Jesus. We look back to what Jesus has already accomplished. But it is that gospel narrative that as they gathered in Jerusalem, that that gospel narrative continued to shape their lives even as that gospel narrative of justice, of being made whole in Jesus, guides and shapes our own lives. But Jerusalem is not only a place of justice. Jerusalem is a place of peace. In fact, that's inherent in its name, Yerushalayim. It is the city of peace. Then and now, of course, it doesn't much resemble its name. And it certainly didn't resemble its name when the Romans were in charge. It didn't resemble its name when Jesus rode in on that donkey. When he entered through the city gates, it was not a place of peace. That those who were against Jesus... were hateful and, and vengeful and bloodthirsty. Their thirst for blood, wh whether or not they knew it, uh, th their desire, as it were, was good, but their understanding w was way off. What they longed for was peace. What they longed for was the way life used to be. What they longed for was the life before Jesus. What they longed for was a life before, Jesus, or before people took the, to the streets and, and took up Jesus' name on their lips. But they had, no, they, they had a, a correct desire, warped as it was, but a holy misunderstanding that through the blood of Jesus, peace would come, but it would be infinitely richer and grander and deeper than they ever imagined. That the peace that would be brought about by his blood was peace with God, perfect in every way. and peace with others, even one's enemies. And the first one has been completed, alleluia. And the second is very much a work in progress. And so we continue to pray, Holy Spirit, complete that good work that you have begun in me. So why were the Israelites glad? Why did they make the journey to Jerusalem three times a year. Why, when the mere thought of it, did they say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. They were glad because of the place and the people and the gospel promise. Because these things, gathering in that special place where God had said, I will be in your midst, as they gathered with others who shared their faith, as they gathered and heard again the stories of the faith, of God's grace and goodness, that it renewed their hope. 
It renewed their understanding that God was at work in the world. It renewed their conviction of what God had done and what God was doing. It renewed their sense of energy that they might join him in his work. To live justly and to seek peace in a world that desperately needs wholeness and shalom, that peace that impacts every aspect of life. And for us, why do we get up on Sunday mornings and why do we come out on Wednesday evenings during Lent and Advent? Why are we glad to be here with one another? To hear again the gospel narrative because we too need a renewed sense of what was and what is and what shall be. And what was? If we are in Christ, then we have experienced true justice and true peace. What is, if we have in fact experienced uh, that, that justice that was satisfied in Jesus, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and if we now know that we have peace with God, then we are to be agents of justice and peace in the here and now. That inaction isn't an option. That yes, if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, then we are to be agents of justice and peace and heralds of what will be. Pointing beyond the temporary, pointing beyond the things that will not be realized until human hearts are fully changed. We are to be heralds of what will be when Jesus comes to establish justice, wholeness in its fullness and to bring to fruition the peace that he has obtained for us and for all people through his death and resurrection. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of corporate worship. For a place that we can gather with others. To remember and rehearse the gospel narrative. Of the good news that is ours because you are a God who is not detached and distant, but one who has drawn near. And one who doesn't simply point the way, but one who has made a way for us through your own body. And so let us not forsake the assembly of believers, but gather all the more as we see the day approaching, as we long for that day when justice and peace, wholeness and peace that is true peace is ushered in forever. And as we long for and wait for that day, may we not be those who are inactive, sitting on the sidelines, but as those who have experienced your justice and your peace, that we would be agents of justice and peace for others, for all. And that in the process, we would be heralds, pointing to that day that is coming, made certain by your resurrection from the dead, that day when wholeness and justice are forever ours because of the work that you have done for us and even for all of creation. So Holy Spirit, move in our hearts, move our limbs and our lips that we might, even as we long for and wait for that day, be agents of justice and peace, we pray. In the name of Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen.
A couple of quick announcements. One, we did have our annual voters informational meeting last Sunday. If you weren't able to participate in the Zoom meeting, it was recorded. You should have received a link for that so you could watch it on your own. If you didn't, please let us know and we'll make sure you get that. Also, this week you'll receive at least two emails. One giving you a general sense that Next Sunday, we will have indoor services two different times to accommodate as many people as possible. There'll be an electronic sign-up, and if that's full, please don't show up. Um, sorry to say that, because we're really limited to that. So if eight or whatever we ultimately decide is the time, if that's full, then we would encourage you to sign up for the later date and then the following week hopefully you would be able to get into your preferred service. Also we will be producing a video this week kind of taking you from the parking lot into the sanctuary, how things will go. Many of us are more visual than just reading things on a page. So we'll do that and then you'll have a better sense of what we've done to make it as safe a place for people to come and join together in corporate worship. As always, if there are issues that aren't being addressed, if you need prayer, uh, some sort of encouragement or help in other ways, please let us know. We would love to serve you as the Lord would enable us to do so. Pastor, and, excuse me. Uh, will the services still be recorded? So if people can't attend either of those services, can they still see the service? Thank you for that very good question. Yes, we will continue indefinitely to record this service. If your situation doesn't allow you to come or if your comfort level, you're just not there yet to come and participate in corporate worship in this place, we will do our best to provide a video of the service so that you can continue to worship from home. Thank you. Now on to the mission moment. Good morning. I hope that this mission moment finds you all doing well. My name is Rob Siebert and I'm a member of the missions committee and would like to give you a brief update regarding our friends at the New Theological College or NTC in Dehradun, India. I recently reached out to both Uncle George Shavani Kamanil 
and Jacob Joseph at NTC to see if they had any recent updates, prayer requests, or praises to report to us. Jacob, who heads up the NTC music department, wanted to say that they are struggling right now with how to possibly teach virtual classes next term due to the virus. In contrast to the theology students, the 25 incoming worship music students need to use guitars and keyboards for their practices, which they may not own themselves. Since the incoming students may not read music either, Jacob is requesting prayers for wisdom how to instruct these students virtually, especially since some of them may live in villages with poor or no internet service. Uncle George, who is the founder and president of NTC, mentioned that he and his wife Leela are still stuck in California since about three months ago due to the virus. He and Jacob are extremely grateful, however, for the financial help that our Savior Lutheran Church has been able to give during these past, this past year to NTC. This includes financially supporting the faculty, the music department, as well as contributing to the college's efforts to help those affected by the coronavirus. Uncle George sent a few pictures of food being distributed through the college's efforts to people affected in various parts of India and Nepal. And I'm just gonna show you four of these real quickly. Sorry for the glare. So our verse, or one verse that comes to mind as we think of our dear friends in India is 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. May God bless each of you and keep you safe and healthy until we see each other in person again. And if you have any needs, please do contact Pastor Jensen or one of the elders in the church. And now back to Pastor Jensen, who will lead us together in corporate prayer. Have a great day. We pray. Father, we thank you for the ministry of NTC, for the vision that you placed upon Uncle George and Leela's hearts and others. We rejoice that their labors over the decades have not been in vain, but that you have raised up many to serve in some of the least Christianized places in the world. We thank you that whatever challenges that they have faced in the past, that you have been more than able and more than enough. And as they deal with new challenges related to COVID-19, that they would take heart as they reflect on your faithfulness in the past and the fact that you do not change. We ask that you would give them wisdom, especially Jacob, as he seeks to train music students for service in your church in the absence of being present in the same room and perhaps having access to good internet and instruments themselves. And so we pray that whatever anxiety rises in his heart, that your perfect love would quell that that you through your spirit would give him insight and understanding as to how best to deal with the, the situation in, in which these students might be well prepared for the years to come. Think about the, the Beatitudes, Lord Jesus, about those who are poor in spirit. That the promise that you make to us is that the kingdom of God is ours even now. We think about those who mourn, Diane C. and others, as they have recently had funerals for loved ones. We pray that they might find comfort even now in the hope of the resurrection. 
We pray for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for things to be made whole, for there to be peace. We pray that they would not lose hope or heart in the midst of these things, but know that a day is coming when they and we will be fully satisfied. You say that blessed are the peacemakers, and so as we live out our days within our homes and our neighborhoods, our schools, places of business, where we recreate, and with those who have differences of opinion about any number of things that you would enable us to be peacemakers. Not peace fakers pretending that there are no disagreements, not peace breakers seeking to exacerbate the situation, but peacemakers seeking to listen well and to express ourselves in ways that is not overly offensive, that we would come to a better understanding not only of what we believe and what they believe, but more importantly, how the gospel would shape our beliefs and the ways in which we live. We pray for those who are sick and dying, which are hard enough in their own right but so much more so when they cannot be tended to and touched and loved by uh, those who know them best. We pray for our leaders, how easy it is for us to complain against, uh, against them because of what they did and didn't do, what they said and didn't say. Humble us that we might pray more earnestly for them because whether they succeed or fail impacts not only our lives, but future generations and those around the world. And so give them clarity and courage and wisdom and much grace. We pray for those who are lonely, a loneliness that has been exacerbated by COVID-19. The technology is nice but it's not nearly as nice as somebody sitting on the couch next to you, somebody holding your hand. And so give them what they need in this time of isolation and speed the days in which that loneliness may be dispelled by somebody coming for a visit or meeting them for lunch or whatever the case might be. We pray that as things continue to open up that you would help us to love our neighbors and our neighbors well. That whatever inconveniences that we might experience because of a mask or some other uh, protocol, that we would do it gratefully for the sake of others. And give us courage and, and faith in these days to live out the hope that is ours a hope made certain, a hope realized, and in the process of being fully realized, Lord Jesus, because you took on flesh and blood, you became the temple and the sacrifice. You are our only hope. And so continue to change our hearts even as we await the day when you make all things new. We pray all these things in your name, Lord Jesus, and joining together in praying as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forever. Amen.